Hey guys, welcome back. This is the third video of our tooling series where we're tooling this pattern here. Again, real quick, if you don't have this pattern yet or this is the first time you're watching this video, there is a link down in the description and you can get a free copy of this pattern and uh, tool along with us. There's two videos prior to this one where we talk about all the steps that got us to this point. In this video, we're gonna go ahead and talk about the next tools in the line, which will be the pear shading, the uh, leaf liner, a camouflage tool, a wiggler, what I call a seed burst, and then a mule foot. And we'll get into each one of those tools here in just a second. The first thing I want to mention is a lot of people have been um, asking, if you've watched the, the first two videos, a lot of people have been emailing saying that Barry King does not have anything called an undercut. And you are correct. Uh, he calls them lifters. That's just th that's just what I've always called them as undercuts, but they are um, on his website. You'll be wanting to look for the lifters. And that's just what he calls these tools here. And um, somebody also asked me if that was technically just beveling is that what we're doing with those or could you use a round beveler for these and that's a very good question because um, I think he makes uh, or somebody's making a round a set of round bevelers round toed bevelers and absolutely you can use those the lifters are really designed for when you're trying to get a lot of lift and depth in certain little scallops like here in these parts of the flower petal and you're wanting to get a lot of depth under there that's where a lifter comes in handy and I and I like to do it here too on these vines where they're kind of curved right there at the end I like to get some depth out of that I don't have round toed bevelers and so I use my lifters or my undercuts I use those as as a beveler technically uh, the main thing is that whatever tool you're using if it's rounded then you want to use a rounded tool. If it's flat, then you can go ahead and use a flat beveler. So that's that's perfectly okay. You might uh, you might find that an undercut or a lifter will work better in these tighter curves like in the scroll and then again inside spots like these little scallops on your leaves and your petals. So I just wanted to kind of clear, clear that up a little bit. Both are correct as far as I'm concerned anyway. I've always called them undercuts so that's what we're using them for and that's what I call them but um, they're the same tool. So but anyway we're going to go ahead and get started on this. The first set of tools this has been cased up since I did the last video and it's been I don't know four or five days. Like I said if you this is the first time you've seen this video and you're seeing this pattern at this point I would highly recommend I'll put links down in the description. I would highly recommend going back and watching the first two to see how we got here. And also, if you'd like this pattern, go ahead and download that now and, and uh, you can tool along with us or along all, all four of these videos. And again, this is just a piece of 13, 15 ounce Herman Oak skirting leather cut to size. And we just designed a pattern here that we're tooling in this video just simply for this tutorial. So let's get started and we'll get started with a pear shader. Okay guys, so when it comes to pear shading or what a lot of people call it thumb pr using thumbprints, which is what I use, and if you look at, at these thumbprints here, these are both Barry King thumbprints, they are longer than a traditional what we would call a pear shader. This would be an old style smooth pear shader and you can see how much shorter it is than the the thumbprints that we're using usually today i prefer the thumbprints with the horizontal lines a lot of people will use the ones with the vertical lines it's absolutely fine it's a personal preference i just prefer the horizontal lines and the scallops where we use these they just catch antique a lot better for me and so that's just the ones that i use either one is absolutely fine you could even use smooth pear shaders or smooth thumbprints i have those as well um, it just kind of depends on the look that you're going for but like I said, both of these are Barry Kings. Um, I, I'm not sure on the sizes. Uh, a lot of my tools don't have any kind of numbers on there. I don't know if Barry puts numbers on these, but I have a small one and a larger one. And for a pattern of this size, I'm almost always going to use the small one. Very seldom will I use the large one, except for on, on much larger format patterns. This pattern here isn't big enough really for this. The same rules apply when you're using thumbprints or pear shaders as in everything else that we've used up to this point is make sure the tool fits where you're going to use it. The places where we're going to use these are on the tips of the vines right in here and then inside these scallops here or where these convex curves are. So we used our undercuts in these concave surfaces here and then in between those we're going to use the thumbprints in there or what I call scallops of a petal and same with the leaf right in here we're going to use them here and here and here and that's going to give a lot more depth and 3d effect to the petal or leaf that you're using it on or even the vine it's just going to give a little bit of shape and that's that's the primary place where we'll use these the biggest rule of thumb like I said is just to make sure that they they fit where you're putting them because we've done a really good job of working hard to carve this 
these lines smoothly and keeping them in a certain distance. We use the correct tools to keep them round where they're supposed to be round. We've beveled really carefully to make sure that they're standing up. The line hasn't shifted. We've got good depth. Now we don't want to come in with a pear shader and just mash the heck out of it and then squash all our work down. So we want to be sure that we've got clearance on each side of the tool where we put that tool. Now one of the things that a lot of people may or may not know or may not be aware of or using, but this tool here has is the same as any other tool. You have a toe and a heel. And normally the way this tool runs, your toe is gonna to be your wider end. The radius of the tool or the toe is much wider than the back end. So this would be the heel and this would be the toe. What I do is, and I think a lot of guys do, but this tool is actually two in one. You've actually, you can use either side of this tool depending on the spot where you're gonna use it. So you'll frequently see me use this tool one direction and then spin it around and use it in another spot on the other side. And that's simply because of the size difference. I've got a, a bigger one and a smaller one on the other side. And so it allows me to use this tool in multiple areas based on that. So I don't see any problem in doing that. You don't necessarily need a different size and only be using the toe. You actually have two sides of this tool and it's absolutely fine to use both ends. Okay, so whenever I'm doing my thumb printing, usually what I'll go ahead and do, and, and I'll, I'll frequently call it pear shading because that's just the, the original tools. When, we, when I started tooling, we were using just pear shaders is all we really used and had um, was traditional pear shaders. And then we started migrating over and using more of a thumbprint type um, impression. And so um, that's, again, the, the, the main difference is just the width of these tools. They're much narrower, which I prefer. Um, and and they're, they're a lot longer, so you don't have to drag them quite as far to get a long tapered drag, and I'll show you that. But I'll usually start here in my petals, and I'll do all my flowers and my leaves first. That's just kind of how I like to work. Like I said, I like to kind of compartmentalize different parts of the pattern, and it just keeps, it just allows me to kind of be sure that I'm, I'm not forgetting anything or missing anything. So we're gonna start here with this little flower right here in the middle. Now this tool I'm gonna use on this flower, you can see how that fits. So if we pick that tool up and put it inside that scallop, you can see how it fits just about right. We've got a little bit of meat on each side of that tool in the leather. And so when we make our first impression, you don't squash down both sides of that little scallop piece. And so as you can see there, there is a small rim of leather right around that scallop. So we haven't disrupted our bevel around this edge but we have imprinted right inside there and that gives it a little bit of depth right in there and that's what we're after. And so you don't wanna run this tool off of the edge of your petal. There are certain times when on, on certain flowers and leaves and stuff where you're supposed to do that or, or you may wanna do that to get a certain effect, but on this particular pattern, you shouldn't do that. So you should always have that little bit of, of space and you can back it off a little bit if you want a little bit more, but I try to get it to where I've just got a nice thin ridge of, of material left after I imprint the tool. Now, the one thing that I want to point out here is, is, as you saw, I hit that tool one time with my mallet and I've basically, I, I leaned that tool to me just a little bit so that the heel doesn't bear down into the leather. But if you see, I, I basically just have a single impression. That's fine a lot of times, but on, on a big pedal like this, we've got a lot of distance right here and before we get into our, our lines from our, our center liner. And so what I like to do with these tools, and some people do, some people don't, but what I like to do is drag these tools just a little bit or walk them backwards just a little bit. You can get two things out of that. One is you can fade this out so you don't have this hard stop right here of this tool to where it just looks like a tool impression. But it, So it allows you to fade that out just like we would with our beveler when we fade out these lines right here. So it gives you that. It also can um, accentuate motion. So if you're dragging this towards the center, which you should be, you, as we go along and we'll go around this flower and do all of these uh, little scallops, we can arc these, kind of sway them just a little bit all to where they kind of converge towards the center. And that's gonna kind of accentuate the motion of this petal to where it looks like it kind of comes out and falls over and it has a little bit more of a direction versus the tool itself is straight. When you just do a single stamp, you end up with a straight effect within a petal that you've tried to carve, you've tried to draw, carve, and bevel with some motion in it, and now you stick a very rigid, straight impression in there. And to me, it draws your eye, and it kind of takes away from some of the, the motion and frequency that we're trying to get into that petal or that vine or whatever we're doing. So you'll see me walk this tool a lot 
there are a lot of uh, toolers that say that if they're they're the horizontal thumbprints, you're not supposed to drag them or walk them. Um, I disagree. And when it comes to what I like to see in my work, I haven't noticed uh, any kind of issues with that. And so I prefer to walk these tools. If you would prefer to use a, a vertical lined thumbprint instead of a horizontal lined thumbprint, um, and, and to, so that you can walk them without mashing down your, your little horizontal lines, that's fine. But I don't find that it's an issue and that you notice anything. And so it, it's completely up to you. So we'll go ahead and, and like I said, I lean this tool to me just a little bit. So as you can see, I'm leaning, I'm leaning that tool just, just enough to kind of basically keep the heel up out of the material because I don't want this. That is not, not very pleasing at all when you've got the heel and the toe at the exact same depth. That just, that doesn't look uh, very pleasing. It doesn't flow really. It's going at a different angle than where our flower center is. And we want everything to kind of converge back to this point of origin here in the flower center. And so this just kind of will draw your eye. Now we're gonna try to cram this one and this one, and it's just not gonna work. So I try to lean the tool, keep the heel out of the material, and then walk that tool towards the center. And so I'm gonna lean and I'm gonna tap and walk. And then when we get to the next one over, we're going to lean, tap, and walk. And so as you can see in this here, I kind of got off on this one just a little bit here because of where this one was first put in. But you can see now we've got a little bit of a curve going. Even though the tool is straight, we're, we're allowing ourselves to kind of give it that little bit of motion. And we'll do the same on the other side here towards the center, towards the center, towards the center. And I'm not going back completely all the way to where my heel of that tool or any of that tool hits any of these dots in our flower center or even the flower center. I'm lightening up the, the pressure of the, of the mallet as I'm tapping as I get, draw back towards the, the middle of the flower. And that's so that it's deeper out here than it is up here. And that's going to really help to give that flower a little bit more depth and a little bit more uh, 3D effect. And a lot of times, as you can see in these, the toe side of this tool is a little bit wide for a few of these scallops. Like that one right there, I should have spun the tool around and used the narrower end. Same side here. I try to keep them the same just for sake of, of uh, appearance. I try to use the same side of the tool per, per um, pedal. But if it doesn't fit, change it. We'll spin it around and use the other side so that it does, so that you don't mess up your scallops that you've worked hard to uh, to bevel. And so there, you you can see that that little bit of curve that we've given into that pedal just by walking that tool back and kind of curving. It doesn't matter if they overlap too much here because we're not going very deep with that tool. And so they can kind of converge and kind of cover, cover each other. That's not going to hurt anything. And so there now we've given our flower a little bit more texture. We've now we've got our thumbprints into this flower and you can see how much more depth and shape that it has. And so that's what we're going to do to all of these flowers and leaves. And if we come over here and do this leaf, we're going to do it the exact same way. The difference on the leaf is we'll be pointing back or drawing back towards this vein. And what we're going to do is we're going to kind of curve it just a little bit because this, as you can, it looks to me that this leaf kind of folds or points upward this way in a bit of an arc. And same here, it kind of goes this way in a bit of an arc. And so we're going to run our tool and, and accentuate that movement just a little bit. We're just going to start there and then kind of curve it back towards the vein. And on our leaf, if we've got room, I try to keep these really separated all the way to the vein so that you've got good separation between all of your thumbprints here. And you've got the room on a leaf because they're so, you know, they're kind of spaced out more evenly. And so you've got the room versus on a flower. I try to draw everything to the center or this flower center so they can kind of converge together and kind of begin to join up just a little bit as they draw towards the center.
And now when you're doing like a leaf or something where it goes up underneath another object or another petal, you need to kind of stick your the, the toe of that tool up under there and to kind of show that that scallop is coming out from underneath this petal somewhere. And so we want to get that up as far in there as we can and then kind of bring that back out so that it's not missing any. Some guys will go and they'll get these two because there's scallop right there and then skip all of these and then get that one. Well, now you've got a big blank spot in here. So be sure and, and just kind of pretend that they're there because they are there, they're underneath this pedal, okay? Now, the first hit on this tool is, is a pretty good lick so that it gets a good impression and then I fade out as I come to the center. So you don't want it the same depth all the way. There's certain applications, certain flowers, depending on your style, you may want to do that. But for my, for me, um, I, prefer to, I prefer to kind of float it back and fade as I get towards the center. And a lot of times, on, especially on flower petals, I will start in the middle of the petal and then, cat, and then work off of each side of it. And that's just to ensure that I have enough room. If you start in the middle, with the middle scallop here, and draw that one in first, then you can bring these two and you know you've got enough room for each on each side of it, basically. So depending on what your flower petal structure is, um, that's a, just kind of a good trick, just to be sure that you, you keep yourself enough room for the tool to, to the next one to come in. So we've gotten all of our flowers and leaves done. And as you can see, like I said, with, it, with just a little bit of curve in those pear shades, you get a little bit of motion. You add, add a little bit of motion to, to the petal or the leaf, whatever you're doing. And you can kind of control how that leaf or petal looks like it's falling or looks like it's curving. Um, and so, you know, your pear shading is just like anything else. Um, it's adding depth. It's adding um, more effect to it, more movement. And so it's just like shading. If you're, if you're drawing a, a picture with pencil or something, you can, you can add more depth to that by changing the way you shade it and uh, changing some of the shadows. And that's what we're trying to do is add a little bit more depth and a little bit more movement. And so now we're going to work on the vine work. And the vine work is a lot of times where I'll use the heel of this tool. Um, especially on flowers and leaves of this size, um, I was able to get almost all of them, um, if not all of them, with the toe side of this. But now I can I can spin it around, and I will predominantly, for the most part, use the uh, the heel because it's thinner and it's much skinnier than the toe is. And so, but I will use both sides, like in something like that little undercut piece right there. We can stick the toe in there and roll that out. And as you can see, I'm really walking that tool now and just really rolling it out to give it a really shaded look under there to accentuate the fact that it is behind this piece here. And so that it's under underneath that and there's a lot of heavy shading in there, a lot of pear shading or thumb printing going on to give it that effect of differentiation between what's, on, what's in the foreground, what's in the background. And so, and now we'll work on some of the vines here and you can kind of just start anywhere and on my vines I do the same thing and I start really at the front of the vine or the tip of the vine and then walk it back be very careful as you do that to not mash down your beveled lines that you've worked so hard to, to do a nice job of beveling so you really want to let off as you get close to this line here um, and so that you don't mash this down. So I'll even lean the tool sideways back to me just a little bit so I stay off of this area here. And it just takes kind of a feel 
and uh, and walking this tool is much like walking a beveler and we talked about in the last video as far as how you hold the tool and how you walk the tool it's very similar except here I will usually have more control walking it towards my hand um, because I'm not going very far and I just tend to have a little bit more stability that way So you can see how much I'm walking walking that tool around and giving it that motion or that movement of direction um, by starting in here and then curving it back and floating it and, and to where it almost disappears. There's no end of the tool. Um, a lot of guys will go in and just hit it once and that's good enough and it sure, certainly doesn't look horrible but to me it looks unfinished. Um, to an extent, I mean, you just, you've got a lot of meat right in here that you could kind of get a little bit more depth out of. And so I know a lot of guys that do that and, and they prefer to do it that way. It is much faster, but I like to just kind of tap that out just a little bit further and just give it a little bit more texture and a little bit more movement to where the tail of that thumbprint kind of just fades out, just like our beveler. So as it narrows up here, our pear shading or our thumbprint fades off in that area as well. And that's just a preferred look for me. Like I said, there, there are no hard and fast rules in any of this stuff. Whatever you like, the way you like it to look, that's all that really matters. You'll notice as you pear shade, as you work through the pattern, you'll notice your background begins to look smaller and smaller. I mentioned in the backgrounding video that when I get done beveling and backgrounding, it always looks like I've got a uh, too much background in a pattern occasionally. But it, once you pear shade everything or thumbprint everything, you, you tend to see how the background seems to be reduced a little bit and that's because you've added texture in the foreground there's not such a big contrast between the foreground and the background and so now your eye is putting all the pieces together just a little bit easier and it's more fluid as we add tool after tool after tool and get near the end of this it'll look less and less background and start to look more evenly composed and so that's why it's kind of Kind of difficult for a lot of people when they first start drawing patterns is to they either get not enough background at all or it's very scattered and very uneven not balanced or they get way too much and they got big chunks of background everywhere it's because it's very hard to see so that just takes practice the more patterns you tool the more patterns you study the more patterns you draw you'll start to get a feel with what's what the right amount of background for your liking is and then you'll get to the point to where you can kind of guess because like i said even on this pattern after we had beveled and backgrounded it looked really like too much background for what i normally would like to see and now it looks just about right for me um, and that's because we've added so much texture to the foreground and so much shading so now everything is more evenly balanced now one thing i just noticed here is that we forgot a piece of background there is a real faint carved line right there where this little vine comes in here and curves back and so we're going to catch that right now and what I'm going to do, and this happens all the time, it'll happen in, especially on big patterns that you do. Um, you can't help but miss a piece here and there, so you just go back and clean it up. It, um, it'll slow you down just a little bit, but at least we caught it, and that's the whole purpose of the reason why I tool the way I do is so that I can kind of have opportunities to catch pieces I might be missing. And so now we'll pear shade this last 
little piece here. I'm going to go ahead and use my toe on this one because it's bigger. Like I said, that's what I like to do. I like to use whatever end of the of the thumbprint or pear shader that works the best. But now we've gotten all of our all of our thumb printing done, so we'll go ahead and put this tool away. And so we've got our flowers, our leaves, and our vine work, and I don't see any that we're missing. And so, and when it comes to casing, I'll usually pear shade. If you notice how dry this is now compared to what it was at the beginning of the video, I like to pear shade with it wetter side than than the drier side. Um, and usually by the time I get to this point now. It's dried out enough where it's it's good for the rest of the tools. But when I'm pear shading, I want to be able to get a nice deep impression. And so I want to be sure that it's just a little bit on the wetter side than what I would normally um, use, use it for other tools. So the next thing that I'm going to do now is a tool that is called a leaf liner. And this is also a Berry King leaf liner. And it only does one thing that I've found to use it for, and that's in these leaves. If you notice the shape of it is, is a trapezoid shape, you'll actually tool with this tool, this top edge up here and this edge over here. So it basically you, you run the tool much like a beveler. And so it'll sit in, in that leaf like that, okay? And so I always lean it. I don't like to use it straight up. Obviously we're gonna mash down everything that we just did with our, with our thumb prints. And so I lean the tool towards the vein and then the tool is pointed towards the front on this particular leaf. There's some leaves um, where you'll do it different, but on this leaf and the majority of them, that tool will point towards the, the tip of the, of, the, of the leaf. And so you'll just, you'll, you'll walk this tool and run it much like a beveler all the way down to the tip of the vein. And so I run this tool um, pretty much the same depth all the way down. I don't, I don't start to fade up a little bit. Uh, occasionally right here at the very tip, I'll, I'll fade it out, but mainly I run the same depth all the way. And we wanna add some really nice decorative lines and shading right there in that area. And so you can see there how much more depth and it also masks or camouflages the back end of that pear shader. So if you look on this side, you can see how you can kind of see the heel because we didn't really have a, a central point in, like in a flower. And so you kind of see a little bit more of that heel of that tool. But this tool clears all that up and camouflages those two tools together and makes them look really nice and gives that vein um, on the outside of the vein there a lot more depth and uh, it'll catch antique well. It gives it a lot more of a 3D effect and depth right there along the vein. And so that's what we're looking for there with the leaf liner. And so we'll do that to all these leaves and then we'll be done with this tool. And Craft Tool makes a really neat one of these. Um, I think it's a Craft Tool. I have a real old, old one that uh, was just a little cheapo that I bought, and it actually does a really good job. And I use it still, but it's a lot. It's a much coarser um, lines in there. They're they're much more coarse and, and spread out than this one. And so on a pattern this size, this very King one looks a lot better. And so there we go, we've got all three leaves leaf lined. And so again, that's the Berry King leaf liner. Works really well for your leaves. Now that's the bulk of what I would call the, um, what I would call the, the, the shading and the beveling. That, that, that pretty much gives everything the texture. Now we're gonna go back and add what I would call more decorative type tools. And these are gonna be what's gonna add little accents and, and uh, more motion accents to the pattern. And so the first of those that I'm going to use is going to be a camouflage or a shell. Um, and you can use any, any, anything you want. You don't even have to do this step. This is just something that I do to my stumps. Um, and I'll show you what that's going to look like. And that's just something I do that's just kind of, I like for the stump, when I talk about the stumps, I'm talking about this part here where that stump comes in and that's the bottom of the flower. And that stump actually is where this circle ends, okay? And so if you notice, we did not pear shade any of these stumps 
any of the spot where the bottom of the flower is, where the circle completes its, its, its revolution, that stump we did not pear shade. You certainly could if, if that's, you know, if you've, if you've got a way of doing that and you want to want to pear shade that instead or thumbprint it or something, that's fine. I like to leave it um, more flat where it's not textured like the vines are. It signifies that this is different than these, that these are vines and this is a stump. It just kind of makes a, 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 a distinction between the different element. And then what I like to do is decorate these. And there's many ways that you can decorate these stumps. Um, and, and I've seen them done tons of ways. And they're all awesome. This is just how I do it. Um, and I'll, I'll probably change it because I'm always changing stuff. But right now, this is what I'm using. And these are both Barry King shell stamps. Uh, shell borders and uh, these are crescents they've got a little tiny crescent right there at the uh, inside there but I really like them for borders and all kinds of stuff I use them around my maker stamp and things like that but this little one works really good on a pattern like this just to give a little bit of texture but not depth to that stump because to me the stump is like the, the base of a rose you know it's the part that actually holds the flower up and so we don't want to mash that down. So what I'm going to do is take this small, um, take this small shell border and just very lightly tap and move that tool. And what that gives us is just a little bit of texture right along there. And that just kind of makes this look even more different than the vines. And that's what I'm going for. I want the eye to kind of catch that this circle went all the way around and stopped right here and so um, I just like to, to kind of signify that this is a stump and not a vine and I'll drag that back till it gets and fade it out as it goes and I don't go very hard right here I'm not I'm not really stamping the tool very deep it's just very lightly and it's only to add texture and so you can see on those two how much texture we've added to those and like I said there's tons of ways that you can that you can decorate these you don't even have to use this tool you can use anything you can use just a regular Tandy uh, uh, Tandy craft tool camouflage if, if if you've got one I've got one that I use frequently on that if it's if this one's just a little bit too small my other one's too big um, but that's what you will use there now if you notice on this side I kind of made a mistake because this was my stump and I pear shaded in there so I really shouldn't have done that that's the bottom petal of the flower and that was my stump but I've already pear shaded it so I'm gonna leave it and um, just call it a boo-boo and leave it alone because if I try to go in there now and do it it's gonna mash it up and add too much stuff going on it's gonna draw the eye to it even more so right now it will go unnoticed for the most part and so now the next thing that I do after my all my stumps have been textured like that, like however you're going to texture them, is I come in with a wiggler. And this is just a cheapo craft tool. And in fact, this one has a number. It's a craft Japan. I don't know if that makes a difference. I don't know where some of these tools came from. But this one is a V821. So it's got a number there. V821 craft Japan is the name on it. Um, it is just a very cheap little tool, probably three dollars from I would assume Tandy or somebody. Um, very cheap, but it works really good. And Barry's got wigglers too. Um, it's not a tool that you're going to use a lot. I say that. I mean, I use it a lot, but it's just a kind of a one-hit decorative tool. So um, I don't think it's that crucial that you buy a top-end handmade tool for that. But if you want one and you want to have only Barry Kings or Clay Millers or somebody else in your tool roll, then by all means, get a nice wiggler. Um, I'll probably break this one one day and get one too. But for right now, we're just going to use this one. Um, and I really like this tool. And what I first place I use it is in my stumps. And I will put that tool right inside the stump here. And usually one, two, maybe three little uh, licks of that tool right there. Just again to accent the fact that this stump is holding this flower up. And so it just gives it a little bit more texture. And so I lean that tool in and I try to somewhat mimic this arc on the outside of that stump. And so we'll just, if I can fit three, I'll get three in there. But that's what I'm going for right there. 
And that's what I've been doing last year, two years, three years or so. And um, I'm always playing with different ways of, of kind of accenting that, that spot and different patterns may require a different thought process there as far as the stumps go. But usually this is the way I'll do it. If you look at many of my patterns, they're usually, that's how the stumps are done. And again, that, that little, little crevice there that this wiggler makes will catch a lot of antique and so add a lot of color right here underneath there. So as the eye travels around, noticing this circle, you know where it stops. And then everything we've done has kind of accented the point that this is not the same as a vine. Okay. And now the next place that we'll use this is usually on a scroll. And if you've got my, uh, my book on introduction to leather, uh, drawing leather patterns, I talk about the different types of scrolls and different types of elements within patterns and, and whatnot. We don't get a lot into a lot of the tool work and talking about the different tools, but we do hint on the difference between some of the elements. And this is what I would call a traditional Sheridan style scroll, um, or some people call them um, different by different names. But And so what we'll do is use this wiggler in order to create some texture and um and and some some element to this to this form to draw the eye to that because so scrolls are, are more of a primary element within the pattern or a focal point within the pattern they're not quite as important as the flowers and leaves obviously but they are focal points and so those are things that we want to accent and not have fall off into the background and so we want to bring them back into the foreground and this is going to help to do that one thing, and it, this probably doesn't matter on a wiggler, but for me, this tool has a little bit of an arc to it. So it runs just a little bit of a bend. And I always run that bend. So we're gonna use the tip of the tool like that, all the way around the scroll on the outside. And we're gonna lean it over quite a bit because we just wanna basically, basically the only place you want the wiggler is right from the middle out, okay? So if you were to draw a line right down the middle of this scroll, you basically want tool marks on the outside. You don't want them coming all the way across. You only want them coming up to about the middle. So we want to lean that tool over enough so that when we hit it, it doesn't breach the middle of the scroll. I'm going to lean that tool over and then we're going to hit it one time. And as I go, I'm trying to keep the back side or the heel side, so to speak, towards the center of our scroll here. And so as you go around, you're turning the tool all the way so that it stays, you know, so that they're running perpendicular to this outside curve, okay? Um, again, this is, this is something that just, everybody does this a little bit different, but that's just how I do it. And as far as the curve, what I was talking about the curve is I have the curve facing me. And so um, I, don't, I don't think it really matters that much, but it seems to have a little bit slightly different look if I have it facing the other way. And I try to keep these close together. Uh, there are certain scrolls where I'll spread them apart a lot, so they're very far apart. <clears throat> but on these scrolls here, I like to keep them really close together. So we're basically just making little tick marks all the way around the outer edge of our scroll. So you can see that there. And you can see how each one of them, what well, our goal is, is to have them perpendicular to this outside curve line. So they shouldn't be running at an angle or up an angle. They should be running just straight dead across. So you gotta turn your tool just a little bit as you come around that scroll. So that's the only scroll that we have in this pattern. So, so that's the only place that we'll use that. Like I said, Wiggler, um, craft tool anybody anybody's wiggler would probably be plenty good you could also use a veiner there just like a normal veiner the thing i would recommend is be sure that it's a very thin veiner you certainly don't want to use one that's that, like this that is very big very bold and um, it's going to really really hurt that scroll work that you that you've worked so hard to bevel and make look nice so i would recommend making sure if you are going to use a veiner make sure that's very thin barry has some very nice veiners um, both smooth and, and textured and all kinds of different kinds but they're really thin and you want to be sure that that's real thin so that you don't distort the scroll that we've worked so hard to carve and bevel just right and so now the next little accent tool that we're going to use is another craft tool. This is a craft Japan as well, and it's an N363. N is in Nancy, 
363. Again, don't know where this tool came from. Probably in a lot of other oddball tools that I've bought over the years. I don't know what it's called. I tried to look on Barry's website for y'all. And he has a really, really nice one that's almost like a, a, a V shape here at the back where this dot is. And, um, and it burst out. And he calls it a seashell fill. I've always called this just a little seed burst tool. But this one here from, from Craft Tool or Craft Japan, whoever it is, it's just real rounded on the back and it still works just fine. But there are certain times like where I use this tool is in areas like this where I've got this little pod right here that kind of kind of um, kind of finishes out this V where th where this stuff comes off here and this stuff's going off the other direction. I've got a V right here with a little pod. I'll usually put a little pod in there um, and I'll use that tool there and I'll show you. I'll kind of put it in there with the dot towards towards the V as far in as I can get it. And then I just stamp it right in there. And that gives me a little accent dot or seed and then some little lines coming off of that. And that to me accents that little pod or that little stop right there in between this V really nicely. And so that's what I that's why I use it there. Like I said, the one that Barry has, you can see how this one kind of shifted our line a little bit there and a little bit there that's because the back end of this tool is so wide that it barely fits down in there and so the one berry has is a lot better um and I, I have plans to grab one of those as soon as i can remember to order one so that it'll it'll fit down in those v's much better the other place where i use this tool which works even better is right here at the base of my leaf in that vein i put it right on top of the vein at the base of the leaf and just one quick tap and then it just kind of, it almost acts like a little stop right here. And it segregates the difference between the vine work and the leaf vein. Okay, because all this comes and then this is actually part of this leaf vein. And so this just kind of breaks that up to where it kind of gives another accent mark. Another cool deal, if we do a video on, on painting or if you've watched my other video on painting leather, um, you may have seen me do this, but if I'm doing a pattern and I've got these and I'm doing what I call uh, um, flower centers and accents, if a customer wants, say, the flower centers and accents turquoise, is I'll paint my flower centers turquoise and also these little dots. And that little bit of paint, just that little bit of paint right there, even if you don't have anything else painted, just that and your flower centers really makes a pattern pop really nicely and adds just a touch of color, um, which makes it look really, really neat but but that's where i use that tool and that's pretty much the only place i use it and i just go along there and find any any place that i have one of those little pods or at the base of a leaf and i think that's all of them i don't have any more any more in there but you can see how now we're starting to get a little, even a little bit more texture a little bit more motion and life out of the pattern with just those few tools so far all right, so the next tool that we're going to do is the mule foot. So this tool is probably one of the most uh, most common tools that people have the most trouble with as far as just the few guys I've talked to tool and stuff. It's just knowing where to use it and uh, how to use it and how to not, not go overboard with it because I think a lot of times using a mule foot too much can draw away from the pattern quite a bit and, uh, and tend to... Uh, cause a little conflict in, in the pattern to where you, it kind of would look better if you wouldn't have used it at all. So my deal on the mule's foot is always less is more. So try not to go too crazy with it and use it everywhere. Um, so I'll show you kind of where, where I like to use it. But these two are Barry Kings. Again, um, I, I like his mule's foot. They're, uh, they're very thin, very crisp. They're not uh, some of the ones that I've seen from Tandy, and I, I have some that I used to use. They're just too bulky. And so when you stamp them, it's just a very thick, uh, thick impression, and, I, and I'm not a big fan of that. These are very thin, and they work well. I do like the bigger one better than the, the smaller one just because the toe is more rounded. Then the smaller one is a little bit more pointy, and sometimes that looks good, but then sometimes it, it doesn't. Um, sometimes that tool just doesn't agree with me as much on certain patterns. So um, I try to use the big one whenever I can just because it has a more of a rounded toe and I prefer that. But on a pattern this size, the smaller one is gonna work much better. And so that's the one we're gonna use here is just a, a small one. Again, I don't have a number on this, but he's got a ton of different mules foot uh, or mule feet or whatever you call them on his website. 
Um, and, and many people make very good mule feet too. And I wouldn't be too concerned if you've got craft tool ones. That'd be my only recommendation is try to get one that's very thin when, you're, when you stamp with it. It doesn't leave a big thick impression. But as far as places where I like to use them, this is the most confusing part for most people is where to put them. Where do you put the mule foot? Um, the places I like to put them are anytime a pattern changes, okay, when there's change within the pattern. And by change, I mean direction, um, elements, things like that. So one change being an element would be here. When this, this, this beam of, of vine work coming around here changes into... It doesn't really change into, but your 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 eye, it's it's converted into a leaf. Okay, so we're coming here, and then there's this leaf. So we've got all these converging lines that come in here, right before a primary element, which would be this leaf. So I like to put a mule foot right there. To me, that just kind of prepares you for change. So if you're going along and viewing this this beam of two of vine work, and you get here and you see a mule foot, it's almost like letting you know that here something's fixing to change, whether it's direction or the element structure, a form, something's gonna happen. And so we can come in here and add just a few. So by a few, I mean three to five, somewhere in there, maybe not even that many. I probably went one too many on this one, but you, you add them in there and that just kind of as you're viewing this and come here, that lets you know something's about to change. And here we go, we've got another element here. Uh, primary element and we change directions and so those two things right there are a good spot for me in my mind to add the mule foot put in place now the way when you're stamping these the way I, um, they're kind of meant to be stamped is the, so you stamp these in cascading um, rhythm okay so you're going to have one and then evenly spaced another evenly spaced another 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 and as you as you go out but what you want to do is the first one is deep, this one's a little less deep, less deep, less, less. So they kind of fade. So you're not doing them all the same depth. You want to do them to where they kind of lighten up as they go back. And you want to do them so that they face away from what you're getting to. So you don't want to run them the other direction where they're pointing towards this. You want them pointing away because these lines are converging and they're getting closer together. And so that's why they're in a V-shaped. So be sure and run them that direction. I've seen them run the other way and it looks really off to me. Um, and it, it just kind of catches the eye and I don't think it looks very pleasing because everything is tapering down. You need to run that V that way as well so that it all, it all fits and flows. And so another place that you can use them, even if there isn't a real big change, is if you've got a big area here. So as you see here, this is these lines converge just begin to converge in here and you've got a certain thickness there same thickness there but then right here it's very wide compared to these two here and so i'll usually put one there and that just accents a little bit of that beam as well so as you're going up that they're they're kind of accenting motion as well as change and so I kind of run them in the same curve or the same flow as the vine work, okay? And so Barry makes one of these that is, it's one tool that's got, I think, three or four of these in one. So you hit it one time and it leaves them perfect. You know, they're, they're, they're faded out. One's deep, one's less, one's less. And he even has some that are curved. But I prefer to just do them singly so I can do them the way I need to and, and, and have them fit the way they should. And so, and then if we come up here, We've got another spot here where you've got this beam coming around and then all of a sudden you've got this stuff going this direction, this stuff going this direction. So we've got a change area in, in here. And so I'm going to use one in here and I'm probably also going to use one right up in this area as well because we've got some change going on here. And so you just got to kind of get a feel for, for how you want it to appear and kind of what you're going for in your style but like i said usually a safe bet is use those sparingly and as you can see on these i set these on this line because this is a very long line that's coming back through here and if i come here i just thought it was going to be a little off i probably could have brought it back just a little bit further over over this area but i kind of have a spacing that i try to do it to keep it balanced and so we're going to try that there again here we've got a we've got a stump coming in here with a little bit of direction change so i'm going to add one or two here and just accent that and then right in here we've got a little bit of a a thick area right there and then here at our stump area 
and then we'll come right here we've got a very wide spot in the beam we'll add that there again over here and then right here And so that's about all I'm going to add. I'm not going to add any more to that pattern because I just don't want it to get too busy. And like I said, those can jump out. You can already see kind of how they jump out. They're really good accents and they really add some motion to the pattern. So if you overuse them, they can make the pattern look extremely busy and, uh, and cumbersome. So you want to kind of be sparing on those. And my recommendation too is to keep them even as best you can evenly spaced here we've got too many actually i probably should have left this one or this one off and spread these out just a little bit um, we've just got a little bit too much going on right here and then here that looks much much better with just having a couple within the circle so just kind of just kind of play with them and and see what what looks best to you and um, and just use them as little as possible at first and then work your way up into your own your own goal with them all right, guys, so that's video number three. Again, we went through and uh, did our pear shading with our thumbprints. I used the horizontal thumbprints. We did our leaf liner in here in the, in the leaves along the, along the vein there to give a little more depth to that leaf. We also did our little camouflage tool or shell uh, along the stumps just to accent the difference between the stump and a vine work. Then we went on and did our wiggler tool, which added, again, just a little bit more accent to those stumps. And also the scroll here to give it some, some more style and shape. Then we went in with our seashell fill, is what Barry calls it, or seed burst, which was just that little bitty dot and, uh, and lined tool that we do there in those pods and on the base of our leaf. And then we did our mule foot, which is this tool here, which just again accents a little bit of motion, direction, and uh, and kind of gives you a notice of change within the pattern. And that's about all we're gonna get to in this video. So in the next video, which will be the final in this series for this pattern, we'll wrap this pattern up. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go back through and we're gonna undercut everything again. Pretty much all the tooling is done. You could stop here and do your decorative cut work, but what I like to do, and I think it's a little pro tip if you're if you're trying to really be sure that your pattern's as clean as possible and uh, and has a lot of depth and everything, is now we'll go through and we'll re-lift or re-undercut everything that we did at the beginning in the first video. So again, if you haven't seen that video or the, the two before this one to get us to this point, go back and watch those two and you'll see what we're talking about when it comes to lifters or um, what I call the undercuts. Barry calls them lifters. And so that's what we'll do in the next one. After we do, the, after we relift everything, kind of clean everything up, we're also going to clean up any kind of beveling that may need some cleanup and any areas where we can accentuate the uh, overlap and things like this where this is on top of here we'll over we'll go ahead and bevel that a little bit just to to further push this back into the background and then we'll go through and do our decorative cutting and so the decorative cutting is where you'll really add the final stage to uh, motion direction and uh, and flow within the pattern and everything will really come together but that's what we're going to do in the last video and uh, then we'll have this pattern completely wrapped up so if this is your first time watching this video uh, be sure to grab that free pattern down in the description there's a link just click on that shoot us your email address in that form and then we'll we'll shoot that right over to you you can print it out transfer it to some leather and go back and and get caught up and be ready for the final video to uh, wrap this pattern up and tool along with us really appreciate y'all watching if you have any questions let me know um, and be sure to subscribe to this channel if you haven't yet and we'll see you next week for the final video thank y'all